<clears throat> I thought this might fit quite well with, um, well, I think it was good to put it at the end of the program because this might be sort of a suggestion of where GIS could go if we want to play around with it a little bit more. Um, okay. So I'm going to show a project which I worked on um, trying to basically take GIS out of the computer lab and put it into the field. So I do a lot of GIS um, and therefore of course I'm interested in landscapes. Um, I put landscapes rather than objects since you know, objects are cool too but landscapes are, are kind of what I'm into. Um, but for me a landscape is something that you have to actually walk about in an experience kind of in situ rather than just sitting in the basement looking at a computer, although I've done a lot of that, and that needs to be done too. So, um, But as an archaeologist, I actually like just getting out, walking about, and seeing what things are like um, in the real world. So yeah, a lot of the landscape modelling which I've done in the past has been kind of undertaken away from that landscape, so there's all sorts of visibility analysis and all of that kind of statistical stuff, um, which I did a lot of, and then I was just sitting there going, oh, I wonder what it actually looks like to stand in this place and look over, over that, uh, that valley. That would be an interesting thing to go and actually do. So I went and so I'm trying to basically figure out how to get GIS combined with the real world and being able to experience this stuff actually in situ rather than just on a laptop. So using um, mixed reality, which luckily I'm in a room full of computer people, so hopefully I don't have to explain too much about uh, mixed reality or augmented reality, but basically uh, on one end you've got the virtu fully virtual environment which is, let's, let's call it Oculus Rift, complete virtual reality, and then on the other end you've got the real world. Um, and then the bits in the middle, so what we're looking at today is going to be augmented reality, so that's a little bit of digital data in the real world, and then there's augmented virtuality which is a lot of the virtual environment and then a little bit of the real world. Stick all of those together and you get augmented reality. How do we access it? Uh, there's a number of different ways. Um, <clears throat> the first way, well when I first started actually looking into this, this was basically the way that you accessed it. There's a lot of very clever German scientists doing a lot of stuff with computer vision and sticking circuit boards on their head. Um, <laughs> but now it's got way more sexy. Ooh, look at these things. So this is Microsoft HoloLens on the top and uh, the Meta AR goggles. It still looks like you've got a connect strap to your head, let's be honest. It's not, it's not like the coolest thing I've ever seen, but it's a little bit better than the guy on the, on the left there. So as with the VR thing, this is really augmented reality is really starting to become big and to become uh, a lot more affordable for consumers. So the Microsoft HoloLens, for instance, is um, when I say affordable, I mean a thousand dollars. Just affordable, maybe to people who work for Microsoft. But anyway, um, but the thing about this is that these things are still tethered to a computer. So you're having augmented reality experiences with these kind of amazing goggles on, but you still have to have a laptop on your rucksack plugged in if you actually want to use these outside of the desk. Um, <clears throat> and then the, uh, the cheap man's AR, you just do it on a smartphone, which is what I do. Um, so I'm gonna be talking about location-based AR. There is a whole other thing with image recognition, which I won't talk about today. But basically, uh, location-based AR uses GPS to uh, locate where you are. It uses a compass to orientate the way you're looking. Um, and this is just visual AR at the moment. Uh, and then, theoretically, it can overlay the data onto a screen with correct perspective. Um, is there a laser pointer somewhere? Here's a laser pointer. Oh, come on. I'm talking about being in the real world. So, um, <laughs> So this is, a, this is a thing which I did up on Hagen Hall many years ago. I think this is an iPhone 2 or something like that. I don't even think that exists anymore, but anyway. Um, so this was just using a, an app called Layer, which was um, still around, actually. And you can just upload some data to it and it will overlay it for you. And you can see on the top right there, there's a sort of radar screen which shows 
where the different points of interest are. So in this place, in this particular example, I was looking at the mild castles along Hadrian's Wall. Uh, and then when you hold your phone up in the field, it overlays the dots in the right place. It overlaid that dot in a perfect place, and it took me quite a long time to get that screenshot so that that dot was actually right in the right place. Because these two over here should actually, that one there should actually be there. <laughs> um, so the GPS thing is kind of not quite there. Uh, you can, if you've got your rucksack on with your laptop in, you can also have a the GPS system as well, and then walk around with the DGPS and your laptop and this huge connect on your face, and then you can really get there. But anyway, uh, but of course, this can also use the same system to trigger sound or smell events, which I'll talk about a little bit later when you're in a specific location. So I got thinking about this, and I figured this might actually be a way to get this spatial data out there in the field. So first of all, we'll look at the vision way of doing it. I'll talk through very quickly an example, because um, <coughs> it uses the same methodology for uh, vision, sound, and smell. So this is a place called Leskinic Hill, or Leskernic Hill, in uh, Bodmin Moor. It's a Bronze Age landscape, which we're going to walk about, so that's good. Um, the red dots are all houses. The green are ritual monuments, cairns, stone circles, that kind of thing. Um, and this is what it actually looks like when you're there. It's a hill with a whole bunch of stones on it, basically. It's virtually impossible to see anything apart from that little, this little nub up here. Just this one here, which is a possibly cosmological ritual monument that the sun possibly goes through on midsummer, but we're not quite sure about that. Um, this is what it's like on the top of the hill. So again, if you look at the GIS, you've got 50 different roundhouses on the top here, but if you're actually standing there, you can't see anything apart from a bunch of stones, right? Um, so how do we get that GIS data out there into the field so you can walk about and do um, some phenomenological work? And actually, the Skernic Hill's famous because of 1996, which fits nicely with the 20 year thing, because this is the place that Chris Tilly, Sue Hamilton, and Barbara Bender did some of their first phenomenological fieldwork, applied phenomenological fieldwork. Uh, <clears throat> so they went out to these houses with a wooden doorway, which people may have seen. They put the wooden doorway in the doorway, which is in this particular place here, and they looked through it to see what they would see. Right? So it's completely um, manual AR, or non-digitally mediated AR. <laughs> <laughs> um, so what I wanted to do was just kind of, you know, put the houses in the landscape, you see, which proved to be quite difficult, as you can imagine. How did, you, how did I go about doing that? So the first thing, I have a digital elevation model, so this is straight out of the GIS. Digital elevation model, locations of the houses and the um, ritual monuments, or let's say non-house monuments. Um, you convert that digital elevation model into a normal 3D model, in this case using Blender. Uh, other modeling packages exist. And then you um, put that into a gaming engine, in this case Unity. Other gaming engines exist. Um, <laughs> And when you press the go button, this is automatically got a little script which I wrote which reads in the geographic coordinates from the GRASS GIS database. Other GIS systems exist. I happen to be using GRASS. Um, so this is live data from the GIS being converted into the right spatial location on the 3D model within the gaming engine. Uh, you can see here that this has in this case we've just got house numbers, IDs, but you can bring in any of the attributes. So if you wanted to, you could say, oh yes, this house was ruined at this time or whatever, and change, choose the different 3D model depending on the attributes within the GIS. And if you're using this as you go along in your excavation or interpretation of a landscape, then you can 
change it and it'll update automatically because it's linked straight back to your basic GIS data. You take that 3D model in the gaming engine, you load it up onto a iPad. I like to have it computer with me. Um, and then you basically align the digital landscape with the real landscape. So you can just about see here there's some, this is the real sky, looking through the, the screenshot from the app, looking through the uh, camera. This is the real sky, this is the virtual landscape of the houses. You can see that it's just about lined up there. Um, <coughs> and when you get that perfectly aligned, you can turn off the virtual landscape and you're just left with the houses or the virtual monuments. So then they look like they're sitting in the right place. And this is of course done by GPS, so you can start moving about and get closer to the houses. It adjusts the perspective and so they get bigger, and what have you. Um, <clears throat> this is a terrible screen shot, I'm afraid, but you can just about see on the corner here, some of these houses are being occluded by the real landscape. So in the back end, they're being occluded by the virtual landscape that you're, because it's perfectly aligned. You turn the virtual landscape off, and it looks like with the power of smoke and mirrors. It looks like actually those houses are being included in that real landscape. So if you start walking down that slope towards them, obviously you see more of the houses. And then you can sit in the houses and do phenomenological field work like Tilly et al did, um, but with your virtual house so you don't have to actually wander about with your um, wooden doorway. And what was actually very interesting about this is when you compare the phenomenological field work which was done with the doorway and then people standing in houses going hello I'm a house you can't see through me and I think so that they could take account of where the other houses were when they're looking through the doorways it seemed like a lot of the houses which they looked at had extremely extensive views of ritual monuments or you'd stand and you know eat your whatever bronze age bread by your doorway looking out at this beautiful landscape but actually when you dump this into the embodied GIS view, mostly you see people's backyards. <laughs> you stand there and there's a huge house in front of you so you don't actually get any of these views. And that was quite surprising because I you know, didn't expect that to actually work but it, but it did so that was good. Um, and then talking about moving across boggy landscape actually. So this is a view from uh, a big hill on probably more called Brown Willy. And um, this is the view through the iPad. And so obviously I've just got these things all meant. This is the village. And let's go and kill. It's all painted on there. So now you can actually walk to that village and it gets bigger and bigger and bigger as you get closer to it. And you have to cross this pole. So you could potentially do phenomenological field work, testing your kind of um, how what's it like to walk across this landscape, but actually do it which could be quite interesting. And of course, because you can augment anything into here, you could also put in vegetation information or whatever. If, you've, if you know where the trees were or whether it was long grass or whatever, you could also put that in. We'd have to have some amazing prosthetic to make it harder to walk as you <laughs> go through the long grass, but I'm sure they can do it. Um, so that was vision. Let's quickly do sound, it's slightly different. Um, using a similar approach though, loading things up into a gaming engine straight out of the GIS and then instead of uh, putting 3D models on it, you put 3D sounds on it. So this is a project which I worked on uh, with a heritage jam in the University of York in 2014. Um, there's a proof of, proof of concept application at York Municipal Ce Cemetery. Um, and what we wanted to do was sort of change the way people think about cemeteries basically. So um, this cemetery here, each of the graves in the cemetery are theoretically geo-referenced, they weren't, but they could be. Um, and then obviously we know what all of the headstones say and quite a lot of the people who are buried within those graves. Um, and a, 
a cemetery is a, that kind of landscape where you know people go there for kind of silent contemplation and that type of thing they're not generally very noisy places and you know you don't run around shouting or anything but they are heavily populated by dead people right and those dead people have stories that they may want to tell or whatever so th again this is just kind of playing with that idea of um, you're in a landscape and then you get a little nudge and you'll see the video in a minute which just makes you think about that place in a slightly different way so it's not a it's not a way to make a perfect reconstruction but it gives you a little nudge just to make you think about something in a different way and maybe that will spark different interpretations so basically you if this works so you walk along with your app um, and then as you turn towards the the gravestones all of the stories start playing on top of each other so again you can't hear any of these individual stories or anything but the point of it is is that it's making you remember that there's people under the ground and all of them used to be alive and they've all got stories so you're immediately thinking about this very quiet space in a very different way um, right so then the next one is the nose so it's a little more difficult um, <coughs> this is where we get to make a culture right so smell and archaeology is completely understudied and it's something which I've been getting into quite lately and I think it's absolutely brilliant and I think more people should do it because it's such a rich vein of human experience that we just have no kind of we very very rarely think about as archaeologists on site when you're excavating you very rarely think about oh yeah and this must have smelt like this or whatever but that completely affects the your experience of or our experience of the landscape you know or whatever you walk down a road and it smells of the brewery then you know you know you're in Edinburgh or whatever but um so anyway so I wanted to play around with that as well this works in a similar way you have a app which uses the GPS that then that then uh, connects via Bluetooth to an Arduino controller, which then fires off different fans. The beautiful fan I'll show you a picture in a minute. And each of those fans has got a specific smell. So depending on where you are and what you've put in your G, uh, GIS, that can fire different smells. Right. So that's all geolocated as well. Running from traditional GIS, you just have to say, "Oh, okay, I've got a whatever." I think this is a animal pen. So you have. The visual bit of the animal pen, you have the sound of the animals when you get closer, and then you have the smell of the farmyard as well. This is what it looks like. Definitely make a culture. Um, <laughs> uh, so there's the, there's the Arduino board with the Bluetooth, it goes through to these fans. Each one of these drawers has a piece of cotton wool in it. That piece of cotton wool is imbued with, with certain smells. Uh, and then as you get closer, one or more of the fans start spinning about. Um, so I'm going to show a video which has the uh, esteemed Roman religion expert, Dr. Anna Collar, who has the misfortune to be my wife, and you'll see why that's a misfortune in a minute. Um, so she's trying it out at uh, the prehistoric trail in, in Moshgar Museum in Denmark. In we did this on a Sunday, so the kids are here as well, so excuse all of the shouts. Oh, there's one. Excuse all of the shouts. Um, yeah. uh, so this is a reconstructed kist grave, um, which is on this prehistoric trail. And in this case, I've programmed the, the uh, dead man's nose, as I call it, to um, play Cannibal Cave. As you get I guess it's kind of smoky and kind of, kind of. You can just see the fan moving. Woody. Wow. It's a very kind of evocative smell that I can't, I can't recognise. That's the thing. It's kind of like cold, cold smoke. Um, cold, cold wood smoke or something, um, but I, I can't 
hot quite places. So um, it's mingling with the smell, the natural smell here as well. So. Um, <laughs> yeah, what, uh, what, other, what other things? <laughs> a bit fiery. Yeah, okay. So, you could already see how that's causing people of all ages to interact with that particular space differently and, and to think about that in a different way. Um, so, multi-sensory augmented reality or embodied GIS or whatever what you want to call it, it's basically just a way to get objects, sounds, smells in the real archaeological locations. You can also do tactile stuff with virtual reality gloves and all that type of thing, but I haven't actually got that yet, but that'll be fun. Um, and be using the augmented reality, you're actually just using the real landscape, which is just a canvas to build upon. So unlike completely VR um, environments, you don't have to build everything from scratch. You've got stuff to play with, you know? And when you're walking around those landscapes, you've already got the kind of effective nature of walking up a hill and that type of thing. So that's, that's already done for you. You don't have to, to uh, simulate that. And all you're doing is just adding in these little bits. Um, <clears throat> But you can also then, because everything's running out of the GIS, you can also, if you really want to, overlay any kind of thing you want to on that real landscape. So you could overlay any um, results of statistical modeling or whatever, and then walk around your results as you're actually there. Um, so we're combining this GIS with this sort of experiential, embodied phenomenological approach. Um, and then multi-sensory visualization, oralization, or factorization, whatever you, you want, um, is very different. And it does use, scientifically proven to use different parts of the brain, which means it does make you think about things in a different way. And it can affect your interpretation of sight. So, um, so yeah, I think there needs to be a bit more of a focus in GIS as we're moving forward about this sort of considering all the senses, not just um, not just the one. Uh, thank you.